Uh, hi everyone. In uh, this lecture, we are going to talk about uh, family systems theory. Um, family systems theory um, actually probably is an umbrella term for uh, the contributions from a number of different scholars. I'll mention them in a second. Uh, but the 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 scholar sort of of note um, primarily because his uh, his contributions have had sort of the most um, uh, the most sort of enduring. Um, uh, tenure in uh, in the with respect to the theory is Murray Bowen. Um, so Murray Bowen, um, I mean he he um, he was born in uh, 1913 in uh, Middle Tennessee. In Middle, excuse me, Middle Tennessee. It was a rural area, as far as I know. Uh, he trained as a psychiatrist, I believe, at Columbia, though I could be wrong. Um, and his um, his really his interest in in families as sort of a unit of analysis. Um, stemmed from his work in the 1950s when he worked with uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, on a project um, where uh, families had an adult member with uh, schizophrenia. Um, he uh, spent time after that as a faculty member at George Washington University and he had a private practice uh, and he actually uh, he's been he's been uh, deceased for for quite some time. Um, his his life I mean was was um, I mean the 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 sort of the genesis of his interest it didn't really come from his experiences in his personal life I mean they really came from his professional life that is to say his time in the fifties working for the National Institutes of um, of uh, of mental health so uh, his his work um, was a little bit different than some of the other people that we've been. Uh, talking about who were really inspired to sort of develop their theories from their own experiences. Uh, Bowen, um, his really came from sort of his own uh, his own scholarship and and, uh, and research. Um, nevertheless, as I said a second ago, there were some other uh, people who made some contributions to um, uh, family systems theory. They made sort of their own contributions. As I said, Murray Bowen is kind of the one that this particular lecture focuses on, but Alfred Ad Adler, Virginia Satir, Carl Whitaker, uh, Salvador uh, Mnuchin, Joe, uh, excuse me, Jay Haley, and Chloe uh, Madane, uh, just to name a few. But here's a couple of the big ideas about family systems. Um, families are, so um, uh, Bowen essentially made the argument that people are best understood in the context of, um, of their families. And that context includes uh, their relationships and interactions um, with with family. Now, unlike, say, what um, what Freud was thinking about, where Freud was thinking about the contribution of families um, way, way, way in the past. Um, let, let me rephrase that. Actually, so Freud was thinking about um, a person's contributions uh, from uh, his or her family in childhood. Freud was working with adults. Adler was really thinking about the here, I'm sorry, uh, Bowen was really thinking about the here and now. So how does a family's functioning contribute to a person's functioning right now? Not decades later as, as Freud was, um, Freud was, was, uh, was sort of, was sort of thinking. So, I mean, from, from, from Bowen's perspective, a person's symptoms was really evidence that their family was dysfunctional in this moment, like, like, contemporaneously, you know, whereas Freud was thinking a person's symptoms are evidence of a family's dysfunction from, you know, from decades prior. Uh, and that was a pretty revolutionary idea. We'll get to that here in a second. Bowen also argued that families can sort of pass dysfunction from, from generation to generation. Um, and really his, his ideas, his idea was that families are an emotional unit. People are tied closely together through those, uh, those kinship kinds of of relationships and, and families are important to people. So this was a fairly revolutionary idea at the time. Um, remember, we're, um, we're sort of, you know, well after sort of the time of Freud um, and we're really in the second and third wave of psychotherapy right now. So the second wave was that behavioral therapy. The third wave was that person-centered um, therapy that we spoke about a few weeks ago. And, and Murray Bowen really sort of was coming in on this sort of fourth wave. Um, and, and so this, you, you know, his ideas were, 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 were pretty radical at the time. Um, he was essentially arguing that people, uh, people's problems are a function of a system and not 
the, not due to a fault or a flaw in the individual. Um, he also sort of made the argument that a person's behavior may in fact serve a function uh, for that family, or it may be related to a family's inability to function in a healthy way. Again, I want to emphasize though that uh, Murray Bowen saw a person's dysfunction as evidence that a family was um, was dysfunctional in this moment. Not um, he certainly probably would have understood that that a family dysfunction would have influenced a person for generations, but he was really thinking about the the sort of here and now. So <clears throat> here's a few uh, sort of systems ideas for you. Um, so systems are related, uh, elements in a system are related. Um, so Murray Bowen was working at a time when this idea of systems theory sort of um, sort of became a big idea in ecology and biology and some other uh, some other hard sciences and, and people started thinking about all kinds of things as, as systems. Um, organizations are systems, cars are systems, computers are systems, you know, the solar system is a system, right? All kinds of, you know, all kinds of things. And so a few general systems ideas, not necessarily uh, family systems ideas, but, but just uh, systems ideas are interdependence. So any ele the elements in a system are sort of related to one another, they're interdependent. Uh, systems have an equilibrium or a homeostasis point. If you mess with one part of the system, uh, that forces the rest of the system to adjust uh, and find a, a, a new equilibrium. Systems also have boundaries. And then when elements sort of loop back on one another, that's called, uh, that's called feedback. If we think about organizations, um, organizations take um, like a factory, for example, or even something like a like a bakery, uh, think about that as sort of a, a, a kind of a generic system for a minute. Uh, a, a factory or a bakery takes um, raw materials that would be input. It does something to them, right? If it's a bakery, it presumably would mix them, you know, mix flour with eggs and salt and sugar and baking soda and things like that, and it would bake it. That's called throughput. Uh, and then it would produce some kind of an output, like a like a cake or a pie or something like that. Um, and when, when people started thinking about, uh, you know, in particular organizations of systems, this idea of input, output, and throughput were, were sort of a, a piece of that. I, I don't really think that families have input, output, and, and, and throughput, um, but certainly families are, are uh, they have interdependence among, among the different members of the family, the different, uh, the different elements in the system. There's, you know, there's equilibrium and boundaries, um, and certainly one person's behavior is going to affect another person's behavior. That would be interdependence and, and feedback. The two other, um, uh, two other ideas here, these last two bullet points. So the whole, uh, the whole of the system is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, that's actually an idea from uh, from Aristotle, um, and uh, that's that's that like the entirety of a system is greater than, um, it, you know, or, or or sort of holds more value than um, than um, than the individual elements in a system. Let me give you an example of that. Suppose you were trying to sell a car, um, and and the car was was um, was missing the the wheels, right? Um, you probably could sell it, um, you know, probably not for very much, um, but it would, you could sell that car for much more if it had wheels. It would be, it, it would all of a sudden be worth a whole lot more. You could sort of think about that, you know, for any, uh, literally anything, you know, a computer. Um, you know, if you sold a computer without a, say, without a keyboard or something like that, you could probably sell it and someone could, could, you know, could buy a keyboard, uh, but but the sort of general analogy here is that if if um, if the unit was complete, if the system was complete, it would be worth more. It would have more value than uh, than if it, if it's missing something. And then lastly, the disorder among the units leads to entropy. That's a systems idea as well. Uh, entropy is randomness, uh, chaos. So when things are are upset, when there's when there's uh, disorder. Um, that contributes to an overall uh, 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 sense of chaos in the uh, in the system. So Bowen had sort of eight ideas, and I've got slides coming up for each of these eight ideas here. Uh, that we're going to run through, and, and these were sort of central to his idea about uh, family systems. So 
Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about here is this idea of, of triangles. Um, so you, in a, in a three person family, there's one triangle. Um, but in a four person family, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch more, uh, of triangles that, uh, that can be made. And you have to sort of, you have to sort of think about this here. If you had a four person system, how many, uh, different combinations of three could you draw? Well, you could, you could draw, uh, you could, you could draw quite a few. His idea of the triangle was really important because triangles were able to tolerate tension. If there's tension between two, uh, members of that triangle, um, then, then, uh, the people are going to naturally gravitate towards that third person with whom they don't have tension. And so that's why he, um, he made the argument that, uh, that, um, um, uh, triangles are able to sort of accommodate uh, 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 tension. And then, of course, uh, you have an insider and an outsider. Um, so when people have, have tension with one another, um, the person with whom they have tension is the outsider, and, and the other two people are, are, are kind of insiders. Now, naturally, over time, this tension is going to shift uh, sort of between people and, and around, you know, at, at different um, sort of sides of the triangle, if you will. And so uh, the tension shifts and, and people become insiders and outsiders at, at different times. The second thing he came up with is this idea of a differentiation of self. Um, and a, a poorly differentiated person, we might, we might think of as sort of codependent. And this is an idea we talk about in the addictions, uh, in the addictions field all the time. So differentiation of self is really this idea that a person can est establish, excuse me, themselves or an identity sort of independent of a, of a family system. Now, no one is really ever sort of completely independent of, of their system, of their, excuse me, of their family system. And, and so what Murray Bowen really wanted to see was that a person was well differentiated. And that his definition of well differ, differentiated was that uh, he, he or she recognizes their ties and their interdependence uh, with their family members. But uh, they're able to stay uh, calm in the face of conflict with family or criticism from family or rejection uh, from a family. Of course, a, a poorly differentiated person is, is someone whose uh, self-worth or, or identity or self-concept is kind of entirely dependent on um, the acceptance and approval of, um, of others in the, uh, in the family system. Um, Bowen also thought that there were sort of four basic relationship uh, patterns. Um, and these were actually sort of problematic patterns. Uh, let me just move myself down here. Um, these were actually where uh, problems in a family would have would have stem, stemmed from. So the there could be conflict between the two spouses, between the two heads of, of the family. There could be dysfunction in, um, in, in one of the spouses. There could be dysfunction in one of the children. Or there could be emotional distance between any two elements of, uh, of the family. Notice that uh, conflict between children or conflict between a parent and a child is not one of his four basic relationship patterns. And that's because he would have seen those things as sort of natural part of, of childhood development. Siblings are going to have conflict with one another. And he would have seen conflict between a parent and a child as sort of a natural, a natural part of parenting. Um, so, so the, the, that's, that's not evidence of dysfunction. Um, evidence of dysfunction would be, would be conflict between, uh, between spouses or, or impairment in, in any one member or some kind of emotional distance. Um, the, um, so family projection, this is where, um, this is where a parent transmits, uh, sort of emotional problems to a child. There was a three-step process that Bowen identified. A uh, parent uh, focuses on the child out of fear that something is wrong. Um, there's there's then some kind of confirmation from the part of the child, usually some erroneous confirmation, um, that something really is wrong, and that that's really that sort of operates on this idea of confirmation bias. Um, and then the the parent treats the child as though something really is wrong, which sort of trains the child to act as though there really is something wrong. So a really simple, uh, probably oversimplified example, uh, maybe a, a parent is concerned that a child isn't reading very well. Um, and so one night a, a child is reading, uh, you know, I don't know, literally anything, a sign, um, something in a book, and 
the child, you know, um, mispronounces or, or, or misreads or whatever, some kind of word, um, that then becomes evidence to the parent that uh, really the child isn't, uh, it can't read, um, when, when in reality what's going on is, is the child only needed sort of a slight correction or a, uh, to be, you know, encouraged to sound out the word or something like that. And then the, the parent sort of treats the child as though um, he or she really uh, does have some kind of kind of reading impairment. A couple more of these here, multi-generational uh, transmission process is how um, um, rationally and genetically transmitted, or I'm sorry, relationally and genetically transmitted information uh, it shapes a, uh, a person. Um, so when there's small uh, differences in, in differentiation between uh, members across generations over time, those differences accumulate, and all of a sudden there there are vast differences between um, between generations. So suppose you have um, you know small differences in, in differentiation between a parent and a grandparent, and then another sort of differentiation between a parent and a child. Well, the sort of sum of the differentiations across those two generations actually means that the, the differences between a child and the grandparent are actually going to be quite large. Um, emotional cutoff uh, really is, is this idea of emotional distance, that people manage unresolved issues by reducing or cutting off contact. Um, and, and certainly that can be adaptive. Um, it can be adaptive, especially in the, in the short term. Murray Bowen would have seen that as a problem if, um, if problems or if distance is sort of over relied on, emotional cutoff is over relied on for a long period of time. And that's because problems are, are dormant and unresolved. So especially if you've got a family with young children, um, emotional cutoff is probably inappropriate. And he would have, he would have argued that it's, uh, that it's inappropriate, that it's best uh, to, to confront and resolve problems um, between uh, between family members. These last couple of things I'm going to mention because they were part of his theory, but they've sort of fallen out of favor um, in the in the in the, the sort of the sort of general world. Um, so uh, Bowen um, noticed uh, similarities between uh, children from different families who who had um, who were born in um, in uh, in. It, in similar positions. So we notice similarities in behavior among oldest children, middle children, and youngest children across uh, uh, different families. Um, and this is an idea I think that's entered popular culture for a little while. Um, you know, most people uh, sort of have a sense that the, the oldest child is often the leader or a peacemaker. The youngest child are sort of followers, attention seeking, they're less willing to compromise, they often get their own way, that kind of thing. And the middle children uh, in families that have them are are sort of the forgotten or um, or neglected or neglected child. Um, this has probably fallen out of favor because it's fairly deterministic, um, and the rest of the theory, the rest of Bowen's theory, really isn't uh, de isn't all that deterministic. Um, uh, you know, families are are capable of changing. People are capable of changing the way they relate to their families, and so for for him to have said something like your your birth order is going to determine how you behave. Um, that's fairly deterministic, and like I said, that's probably why it's sort of fallen out of uh, out of favor. Um, the last of uh, his eight big ideas here was a societal emotional process, and that's the application of these family relational processes to, to other groups, say a church, uh, some kind of organization, you know, a club, a sports team, that kind of thing. Um, so he found similarities in um, in in other groups of people who weren't sort of bound by kinship. Um, but were bound maybe by mission or, or interest or, or uh, you know, faith tradition or something like that. So um, the therapist role and, and function in a family systems theory is, is that uh, he or she's probably an objective researcher uh, or, a, you know, maybe a teacher, a coach, kind of a, an observer. Um, really the goal in, in family systems theory is to help people understand and assess their relational styles in their, in their family. Um, so the therapist really should emphasize personal choice and family functioning. And that introduces uh, Murray Bowen's idea of circularity. And circularity is, is that um, the focus of change is in, is in relation to others who are recognized as having an effect on, on a person's functioning. So let me say that again, because that's actually kind of an important idea here. 
um, circularity is this emphasis on personal choice. And so if a person changes the way they relate to others, uh, that person's behavior is going to change. And suddenly, um, because that person will treat the, 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 the client, uh, the person with whom the therapist is working differently, uh, that's going to alleviate some symptoms or, or sort of create a change. And, and really what that is is a systems idea. It's asking one element in a system uh, or family um, to change. And then there's some kind of feedback that happens between those two elements in the, uh, in the system or those two members of the family. Uh, a couple of weaknesses here. Um, uh, Bowen was sort of overly focused on differentiation um, and his, his work sort of you know, reinforced sort of um, a patriarchal family and it, it reinforced sort of a traditional family structure. Um, you know, maybe you can't fault Bowen. Uh, he was working at a time when um, that's, uh, you know, sort of what, what had to be emphasized. Um, you know, like I said, maybe that's not really, uh, um, um, you know, that is, I mean, that's one of the shortcomings, um, you know, What's interesting, actually, uh, here I'm going to say this in a, in a second, is that um, uh, these uh, family relational processes have found to be valid in in um, in non-traditional family systems as well. So, um, you know, while he was sort of overly focused on a patriarchal traditional family structure, um, his theory's been been sort of applied um, since his death on on like I said, non-traditional families. Uh, and like, a, and it's, it's found to sort of, um, uh, have some, have some validity to it. A couple of strengths. It's a fairly well-researched theory. It's, it's been sort of adapted into sort of manualized treatments, um, you know, that, that have names like functional family therapy, things like that. Um, so it's well-researched. Um, Bowen was, was sort of articulating testable principles. Um, and he also sort of you know, brought to light these, this idea that uh, there are multi-generational issues in, um, in, in families. Of course, the other thing he did is that he, he sort of expanded um, um, the, the source from which a person's problems can, can extend. Um, remember, really up until this point in the, you know, the 50s and the 60s and, and things like that, um, you know, people are dysfunctional because of, of you know, something in them. You know, it, it could be their own, um, you know, psychopathology is sort of the fault of the individual. Um, and he was, you know, really one of the first to say, well, you know, people are part of a, of a social system uh, and, and a family is sort of the, the first and most basic social system of, you know, to which a person belongs. Uh, and if that is dysfunctional, or unhealthy in some way, then, you know, a person's going to experience um, psychopathology or, you know, uh, distress. And so he sort of expanded, um, you know, how or, or where problems could arise from uh, in, a, in a clinical point of view. Uh, and, and like I said, that's, that's one of the, uh, one of the sort of enduring strengths of, uh, of uh, family systems therapy. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's it for this video. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. Thanks for watching.